I want to review uh, what we've done the last couple of days and complete a few points that, are, that weren't quite clear. Uh, and then I want to talk about uh, general modular, global modular questions, and uh, when, they, when something exists, when it doesn't exist, and then the most important, formal modular, which is sort of in between the infinitesimal and the global. So let's just start with a little, a little review of what we've done. Because we've studied uh, a, a particularly two different kinds of deformation problems. I want to list three or four more others that I'm not going to talk about in detail, but follow exactly the same pattern. So the problem we first followed we studied were uh, closed subschemes. And in that situation, we fix an ambient space, X, so a non-singular projective. And then we consider a uh, set of all closed subschemes in X with some polynomial, double polynomial, uh, fixed double polynomial. And <coughs> in this case, we have the, the best possible kind of moduli space, namely the Hilbert scheme. So in this case, there exists a Hilbert scheme whose points, so the points, correspond in a one-to-one -one manner with the elements of this set. Let's call this set something. Just call it S for right now. So S is, so the points of the Hilbert scheme have a one-to-one -one correspondence with the elements of the set X. That's the first requirement for a moduli space, is that the points of the points of the parameter space should correspond to the elements of the set. Second, there exists a universal family, sorry, not x, y, contained in x sub h. So there's a, there's a universal family, so for each point h, the fiber is precisely the scheme that it corresponds to by this correspondence. So that's called the universal family, or actually it's called the topological family. And then we have the third property that for any family, um, what should I call that? Let's call this what's it y. Okay, let's just call it y over t. For any family of these things, so for various t's and t's, I have various y t's, and these are all contained in this fixed x, this fixed uh, ambient projective space. So for any family of schemes of this kind, there exists a unique morphism from the parameter space into this universal parameter space with the property that for each t, call it p of t, is equal to that h that corresponds to y t according to this one-to-one -one correspondence. That's the third property. And the fourth property is under those circumstances, this y is actually equal to the universal family cross over h of t. So this is, this is the best possible kind of moduli, it's called a fine moduli space, where you say that this H together with the family Y represents the function. And I won't give you the definition of representing the function. <coughs> that would take too long. So this is the best possible, or best, best of all possible worlds. And the corollary of this situation is that this statement about the, the universal families applies also when T is infinitesimal. So it means that if t is equal to spec A, an ordinary, then the families of y over t is the same thing as giving a homomorphism from h at uh, the corresponding point into A. So for each family over an Arden ring, you have a morphism from spec A to h, which corresponds to a ring homomorphism of the local ring down to A. And it's this fact that we've been exploiting to say, corollary of that, is that uh, the families uh, y over the dual numbers correspond to the Zariski tangent space at h at y. And then if there's no obstructions, that h is non singular at the point h y. So it, the, the way we are able to determine properties of H according to the infinitesimal deformations over the dual numbers and extensions depends on the fact that we have this universal property 
that families correspond to morphisms to H. That's what allows us to deduce properties of H from the infinitesimal study. And in order to do that, we need to have the fine moduli scheme. So this is the best of all possible worlds. Now, we also talked about, oh, but let me mention another one. Oh, I actually went to part of our review, so that also the review was that the, the uh, deformations over the dual numbers are given by H0 of Y and the normal number of Y of X, and also the instructions to deforming over Arden rings, C, are given by H1 of Y and the normal Y of X. Only for the second span of H1, we need a hypothesis on Y, that Y is either locally complete intersection or Cohen Macaulay in codimension 2 or Gorenstein in codimension 3. This is shorthand. CM2 is Cohen Macaulay in codimension 2. <coughs> G3 is Gorenstein in codimension 3. So that's the situation for closed subscapes. And we've seen some examples and, and calculations. Now there's another situation that's also very nice, <coughs> and that is to study line bundles. So I haven't talked about that before. There's another deformation problem. You fix x, and you consider the set of line bundles, L. So L is a line bundle on x. And let's make x be uh, projective. And then we can talk about the fixed degree. And then one can parameterize line bundles. So this is, again, a beautiful situation. It's the best possible. There is a group scheme. So of course, line bundles form a group under tensor product. So we don't get, not only get a scheme, we get a group scheme. So there's a Picard scheme. It's called Pick X. It's the Picard scheme. And I'll put a little D here for uh, degree D. So it's a, it's a um, well, actually, uh, let's make degree 0, because then we can make the group. Then it's actually zero. work. What? Otherwise, it doesn't work. That's right. So it's a group scheme, Picard scheme. And this also represents a functor, so that when you have the Picard scheme of x, and you have a universal thing, L up here, and with the property that the points of pick x, their fibers correspond to the different bundles, and for any family, so what is a family? A family would be xt over t, and on it some line bundle L. For any family, again, there exists a unique morphism uh, that, that, that pulls back. As a consequence of that, we can do the same infinitesimal study. So the uh, Zariski tangent space, uh, the deformation, the law of deformations over the dual numbers are given by H1 of the structure sheaf, OX, and obstructions are in H2 of OX. But actually, in this case, we don't care about obstructions because since we know it's a group scheme, a group scheme is smooth anyway. Ah. That reminds me of another comment that somebody asked a question I really should make. When we talked about the obstructions here, the point is that when you, when you try to make a deformation problem, you try to extend one step, there's an element of this group which is an obstruction. If that element is zero, then you can continue. But not every element of this group may occur as an obstruction of anything. So we saw one example yesterday, the plain quartic curves inside of P3, where the group H1 was non-zero, but the scheme was still smooth. So in fact, since the scheme is smooth, that means in fact you can always extend deformations even though this H1 is non-zero. So then you might ask, well, inside of this group, there's some subgroup which represents the, the effective obstructions, the, the elements that actually occur as obstruction of deformations. What's that? Well, that's a hard question. Yeah, I don't think there's any satisfactory answer to that. So this is the only problem with obstruction theory. Obstruction theory gives you a group which measures whether you can, whether you can extend obstructions, but the elements, it, it may be irrelevant. They may never, they, always, they may all be, always be zero. So that's a weakness of the theory. So anyway, I just wanted to mention line models. I won't, I won't say anything more about line models. I just wanted to put them there as another example. Then, uh, oh, well, while we're at it, I'll put vector bundles. So if x again is fixed, projected, uh, I think I should do this on another board. So
So let's do three vector bundles. Where's Diane? Am I writing big enough? Yes. <laughs> so, so. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, vector bundles. So um, a fixed X of projective scheme, and I'll consider a vector bundle. So this, that means a locally free sheaf, say rank R, and some degree uh, D, some degree something or other. Then we can ask to, to study isomorphism classes of these. Now, in this case, uh, there may not be, uh, oh, I should say another thing. I, this is a fine marginalized space. There's also, now I should do, wait, you know what I'm going to do? I want to do, I want to do varieties first, because then I'll have the note. For, so that's number, th number four. We'll come back to that in a minute. I want, I want to do three first. So let's do three. Three is abstract varieties. And this we have talked about. So in that case of the abstract variety, of some, you have some uh, abstract variety x naught, and you want to study deformations of x up to isomorphism. Well, we did do an infinitesimal study. So in the case, in the affine case, two cases. In the affine case, we found the deformations over the dual number is given by the functor t1 of x naught over k, and the obstructions are in another group, T2, of x naught over k, which I didn't define for you. But we did talk about the, the uh, deformations there. And then in the case that x naught is non-singular and projective, in that case, there's no local obstructions, so it's a global question. And there, the tangent space is given by h1 of x and the tangent space of the tangent bundle, and obstructions are in H2 of x in the tangent bubble. So we've done the local study, but what about a global, what about the existence of some kind of global variety? Well, first of all, there's practically never a fine moduli space. But in certain cases, like curves, for example, there's something called a coarse moduli space. So there's a theorem which says if x naught is smooth curve, of genus G, then there is the so-called coarse moduli space. And what that means is, it's a variety MG. So watch the parallel with that situation up here. It's a variety one MG whose points are a one-to-one -one correspondence with curves of genus G. So that's good. Secondly, whenever you have a family of curves, X over T, you have a family here, for any family, of, of non-singular curves of genus G. There exists a unique morphism from T to M, such that for each little point T, it's what you want. You've got the curve XT. T goes to the point, uh, phi of T, that corresponds to the curve. So that's good. But th there's generally two problems. There may not be any tautological family. It just may not exist. And of course, if it doesn't exist, you can't say that this is the pullback. So in this case, when you have, when you have these properties, the one-to-one -one correspondence and the existence of a unique morphism for any family, that's called a coarse moduli space. Well, it's very nice, um, but because we don't have the universal property, we cannot apply this. The infinitesimal study of the curve does not tell us anything about the moduli space. So, the infinitesimal study here is a very interesting study, but we cannot draw any conclusions about the MG from that infinitesimal study, because we don't have that, that property. Now, we computed the other day that for a non-singular curve, uh, the, the deformations has a space of dimension 3G minus 3, and there's no obstructions. So if this was a good space, it would say this was non-singular of dimension 3G minus 3. Well, it happens it does have dimension 3g minus 3, but it may have singularity. So the moduli space, uh, not, for, not for genus 1, but I don't know when the first, first, uh, first singularities occur. At least genus 2 or maybe genus 3, there's singularities. Anyway, this can have singularities. So let me give you one specific example. For example, if you take elliptic curves,
That means non-singular projective curve of genus 1. And uh, people usually make a fixed point because the elliptic curve has, has automorphisms. It's a group structure. So to get rid of that, you take a fixed point. So elliptic curve will be a point, a curve x null, together with a fixed point p. Right? And there's a modulized space for these. It's given by j. So there's an invariant j. And if you take the affine line uh, over j, that is, of course, modulized space. So what that means is the curves up to isomorphism uh, in one-to-one -one correspondence with elements j, the j invariant. And secondly, for any family like this, there's a morphism which, for each point, sends it to the j corresponding to that final. However, in this case already, there does not exist the tautological family. You cannot find the flat family of curves parametrized by the j line uh, giving all the right curves. I put that as an exercise on the exercise page. If you have trouble, then you have to look in the book where it's explained in a little more detail. <coughs> yeah. OK, now let's, uh, let's mention uh, nectar bundles. <laughs> so the vector bundle problem, x is a projective variety, e is locally free sheaf uh, of rank r. And if it's higher rank and higher dimension, maybe you fix the churn classes so you have a reasonable family. And you want to know, is there some kind of a nice moduli space? Well, in this case, there may not even be a coarse moduli space. So I want to give you a counterexample. So, there may not be even a coarse moduli space. So to understand the problem, let's take x equal to p1. And let's take e, a vector bundle of rank 2, and degree 0. Well, perhaps you already know about vector bundles on p1. Every vector bundle on P1 is a direct sum of line bundles. So the line bundle of degree 0, E must, must be isomorphic to O of A, direct sum O minus A for some integer A in Z. I can even take it greater than equal to Z. So up to isomorphism, the set of rank 2 bundles of degree 0 on P1 is a discrete set. It's, uh, indexed by the integers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. So that's my moduli space. It, it, its points correspond in a one-to-one -one fashion to isomorphism classes of these vector models. That's good. But consider the following family. Um, take a parameter space T, is spec K of T, and then on P1 here, take an extension of O minus 1 to E to O of 1 to 0. And if you know about your x, to define an extension of two line bundles, you need an element C in x1 of O of 1 and O of minus 1. And that's H1 of O of minus 2, which is a k-dimensional vector space. So, this is, this is actually a vector space, and I take t, I take t to be that c. So for each t in k, I get an extension e sub t. Now what happens? When t equals 0, that's the trivial extension. That's the direct sum. So, so the e sub 0 is just O minus 1, direct sum O of 1. When t is non-zero, it's a non-trivial extension. And it happens, you can, you can calculate, the non-trivial extension here is just O plus O. So Et is O plus O for any T not equal to zero. So here's a beautiful family. And at zero, the fiber is, uh, is the trivial one that corresponds. So zero has to go over here to the point one. And for all the other points, they have to go to the point zero. Well, there is no morphism of the affine line onto a set, discrete set of two points with this property. So there simply is not a morphism that is not a close modulus space. So this is the worst of all possible worlds. Now, uh, there's ways around this, uh, which I'll probably talk about. Well, I hope I'll be able to, I only have one more lecture. I, I may be able to talk about this a little later. The way you ways to get around this is to talk about stable methods. or 
simple. Vector logic. So if we have time, I'll talk about those. But this is this this shows why you need to do something special in the case of vector bundles. All right. So this is a sort of a review of the kind of things that are happening. For the post sub schemes and the line models, we have a fine moduli space. The function is representable. It's very beautiful. For uh, for affine or for abstract varieties, in some cases, we have a coarse moduli space, like for curves. But already for surfaces, uh, except in some special cases, there may not even be a coarse moduli space. So it's, it's terrible. Uh, and for vector bundles, we have this problem, which, which, is, which is, prevents even having a coarse moduli space. But for vector bundles, we can still do the infinitesimal study. The answer to the inf infinitesimal study is that deformations of the dual numbers are given by x1 of e and e, and obstructions are given by x2 of e and e. <coughs> so we can still carry out the local construction. I won't do it in detail. You can find it in the book. But it's still, you can do the local construction. So then the question would be, even in the absence of a coarse moduli space, what's the value of this calculation? What, what good is it? Is it any good? <coughs> OK, so now that brings me, that closes the review. And that brings me to the next topic for today, uh, which is uh, formal moduli. Okay, so let's start here. So what do I mean by formal moduli? Well, uh, up to now, we've studied deformations over the dual numbers over, or over Arden rings, so infinitesimal. That's the one side. That's the very small side. And then just now, I'm giving you a review of the global question of, of, of moduli, which is, which is very uh, uneven and unsatisfactory. So a formal moduli is a question that lies in between those two. So it lies in between the purely local and the global. And here's what it is. The idea is, if we have an x0 uh, over k, just for the sake of argument, let's, let's take the case of abstract variety. So x, x here is abstract variety. Then for each Arden ring A, we've, we've discussed the issue of deformations of x0 over an Arden ring. And we've discussed the issue of extensions uh, when you have it over some Arden ring, over a bigger Arden ring. So you could imagine now um, something or rather universal which would sort of encode all the information that you have in all possible Arden rings. So you might ask for something or other, let's call it script x over some r, where r is going to be a complete local ring. And uh, well, x is sort of a formal family, but I don't really mean an actual family over r. What I really mean is that for every quotient, r over m to the n, you have a, a scheme xn, which is a deformation of x0 over k. So supposing that you've got a complete local ring, and this is sort of in quotation marks. It, this may not actually, this isn't actually anything there. Uh, but what I want is a collection for every n of a scheme xn over r mod m to the n, which is a deformation of x0, so it contains x0 and with the property that these are compatible with each other as n changes. So uh, if I have x, this one is equal to the next higher one, x n, n plus 1, cross over tensor over r with r mod n to the n. And x tends to the n plus 1 would be over r mod n to the n plus 1. So imagine for every n, all of these guys. So the limit of these rings down here will be just r. If r is a complete local ring, it's the limit of these guys. What? What did you just write? What did I just write? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Something. <laughs> okay, let me write that a little bit. Okay, so I'll, I'll write that bigger. We want something or other in quotes over a complete local ring. And what this something or other is, is, it's not a scheme, it's actually a collection. It's a collection of for all n, it's a scheme x to n over r mod n to the n. 
with the property that for each n, x n is going to be equal to x n plus 1, cancer over r mod n to the n plus 1 with r mod n to the n over Oh, over, over the, over, it's also over r mod n to the n. So x to the n plus 1 is over r mod n to the n plus 1. If you tensor it with r mod n to the n, it should be equal to this one. And, well, equal, there should be a, also compatible, I should, instead of saying equal, I should say there are a compatible set of isomorphisms. And these are all deformations of x0. In particular, x0 is equal to, under this notation, uh, if n is, oh, n is, x0 is x1 in this notation. So, so this, this quote thing means the collection of for every n, all these xn's, together with the morphisms, so that they are all deformations of xn, each one is an extension of the previous one, and they all fit together. So this is, this is what you might call a formal family uh, of things over on one Now, you could take the limit of these schemes over R mod, and then you get a formal scheme. But uh, if you read the definition of a formal scheme carefully, there's some hypotheses which are not always satisfied. So strictly speaking, it's probably best to just consider the set of all of these things. Now, so that's something we can talk about. If we have, a, if we have an increasing family, um, a sort of asymptotic family, to thicker and thicker and thicker things. But what we really want, we want a universal one of these. So that's what let's ask for. Does there exist? a universal one. So we want some kind of a universal such thing. Look for a universal and what exactly does universal mean? Well, it's going to be the weak form of universal and the strong form of universal. The weak form, well, I'll do the strong form first. The strong form of being universal says that for any deformation x over a, where a is the r degree, which is a deformation of x0, and here's r, and here's my x, there should exist a unique morphism of r to a, such that x is obtained by base extension from script x. But what does that mean? What that means is that uh, whenever, of course, any, any map from a complete local ring to an r n ring factors through some r mod n to the n. And in that case, I want x to be equal to xn answer over r with a. So let me say that again. So for any family x over a, there is a unique morphism of r to a such that when you factor it through r mod n to the n, this is obtained by tensoring that x to the n in my family with a. And of course, the n doesn't matter because the x to the n's are all compatible. So this, in, we, by use of notation, we can call this script x tensor over r with a by use of notation. That would be the universal one. Because what that would say is then that every family arises this way, and conversely, any time you take R and tensor with some R, you will get some family. So all possible infinitesimal families then are gotten out of this single complete local ring. If this happens, we say the functor is co-representative. I haven't told you what the functor is. I, I'm trying to avoid the language of functor. The, the, the functor, functor is basically for each Arden ring you consider the set of deformations over that Arden ring. And if this happens, then all the nice things, all every, our infinite, infinitesimal study is very good. Because if so, then the tangent space to R, which is MR over MR squared, uh, dual, dual vector space, is going to be equal to the deformations over the dual numbers. Why is that? Because if you have a deformation over the dual numbers, that corresponds to a homomorphism of R to D, and D is just K of T modulo T squared. So the only thing that's relevant is the map on M, which goes to uh, the one-dimensional K vector space divided by T, which factors through M on M squared. 
So the deformations over D are exactly the tangent space to R, meaning now simply the dual of M by that squared. And secondly, if there's no obstructions, then R is a regular local root. Why is that? It's the same proof I gave you the other day. If there's no obstructions, that means we can start with the polynomial ring and you get up to a power series ring, then R maps through the power series ring and becomes isomorphic. So this notion of pro-representable is the formal version of a representable function and has the same benefits in terms of uh, the infinitesimal study and what we can learn from it. <coughs> okay, let me just mention the weaker form. The weaker, the weaker form is uh, for every x over a, we've got a, a script x over r, for every x over a, there exists a corresponding morphism, so no longer unique necessarily. And furthermore, that uh, uh, m mod m squared dual is equal to, what do I want to say? It's an isomorphism on, is equal to the deformations of the dual numbers. So I want, I want it to be ex exact for the deformations of the dual numbers. In other words, oh, I, I should say it that way. It's not unique in general, but for every x over d, then there's a unique mapping from r to d. So this tells me that the, the, the tangent space is correct, but in general, uh, you may not have, this is called a mini-versal family. So, um, well, clearly this notion is of interest, theoretical interest, because it lies between the local and the global, but it wouldn't be useful unless, the, unless it was something you could work with. This was proposed by Grotenby in one of his lectures in the series, uh, FGA, one on one of But the real value of it is due to a theorem of Mike Schlesinger, which gives a criterion for a function to be pro-representable. It's quite a useful and manageable criterion. Uh, I'm not going to state uh, by stare because it's a little bit technical to state. But you can find you can find the statement uh, in the book there. But I will tell you some applications. So a couple of applications. Uh, Before I give an application, let's just say something obvious. If the global functor is representable, then the formal functor is pro-representable. You just take the global family that represents the functor and take the completion of the parameter space at the point, and that, that does it. So anytime you're representable, so representable globally implies pro-representable functor. So that takes care of the Hilbert scheme. But what's interesting is that uh, in the two other cases we talked about, vector bundles and um, abstract varieties, which are not, pro not, not globally representable in general, so for abstract varieties, <coughs> we have the following results. If x0 is either a affine with isolated singularities, or be projected, then uh, deformations of x0 has a mini-versal family. And secondly, if x0 is projective, and if h0 of x0 and its tangent sheaf x0 is equal to 0. So the tangent sheaf is sort of gives you local automorphisms. To say that the tangent sheaf has no global sections, we express by the phrase x0 has no infinitesimal automorphisms. So that says no infinitesimal in the decimal automorphisms. 
In that case, uh, the functor is actually pro-representative. So that's the, that's the best good case. Um, and for vector bundles, so to include the vector bundles, if you have a, a, x here, if you have a, 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 is a vector bundle, and if E is simple, if you just look at simple vector bundles, then that, that functor is uh, uh, also pro-representable? Yeah, that's pro-representable. By simple, you mean without sub uh, I'll, I'll tell you in a second. Yeah. Pro-representable. Simple means H0, um, the endomorphisms of E, is equal to the ground field. In other words, the only morphism of E into itself is the constants, is scale of multiplications. This property is weaker than being uh, stable. A stable bundle is automatically simple. I haven't given you the definition of stable, but stable is a stronger condition. But for pro-representable, it's enough to have simple bundles. So then it's pro-representable. So that means it has this very nice universal family uh, over, over uh, in the formal sense. Yeah. Okay, see so how much time? Oh, I've still got some time. Very good. Okay. So I'm not going to give you any details here because the, the statement, already the statement of Schlesinger's criterion is a little bit, a little bit compact, compact, complicated. You have to understand these functors of argument that exist. It's, it's just technical. It would take some time to explain. And so, and, but these applications follow directly from Schlesinger's criterion. And a particular case, so, oh yeah, for curves, you see, Look at the second one. If it's projective and no infinitesimal automorphism, then it's pro-representable. So for curves of genus at least two, the group of automorphisms is finite. Any curve of genus at least two, the group of automorphisms is finite. So there's no infinitesimal automorphisms. So curves of genus two is always is a pro-representable function. And so we've studied, we've done the study there, so we can find that R, therefore, is a regular local ring of dimension 3G minus 3. So we don't, there's, we can't, we can't yet draw any conclusions about the global course of space, but this, this formal representable, once we know it's pro-representable, the infinitesimal study applies, and our previous week work that we've done shows, therefore, that the dimension of this local ring is 3g minus 3, and it's regular because, it's, because there's no obstructions. So that's very nice. Yeah. Okay. This hypothesis that the H0 is zero is stronger or weaker than having no, uh, having a discrete automorphism. Do they compare? Isn't it a good one? Uh, uh, let's see, you could have a discrete, so it could be, you could have an infinite discrete automorphism, yes. that's okay. No, just no infinitesimal automorphism. Yeah. <coughs> so this, this really, that's what, so it's the same thing as the automorphism group is discrete. For elliptic curves, there's a problem, because for an elliptic curve, you have a one parameter family of automorphisms, but if you fix a point, so if you take the elliptic curve together with a fixed point, that kills the, the group of automorphisms, so that for elliptic curves, with a point, this also applies. And for, um, oh, I don't know if I gave you this example once before. Before I go on, let me give you one example of a course modulating like state place that you can understand completely. Let's study curves of genus zero. Non-singular curves of genus zero or algebraically closed field. <coughs> well, you know that any curve of genus zero uh, well, over, over, over non algebraically closed field, there may be many of them. But over algebraically closed field, there's only one, T1. So the question is to study all possible curves of genus 0 up to isomorphism. It's the second consisting of one element. So the modulized space is a little modulized space consisting of one point. That's M0. And notice that this has a tautological family because you can just put P1 over the So it has a tautological family. It's also a coarse modulized space. Because anytime you have a family of deformations of P1, which, what does that mean? It means, a, it means a variety X together with a morphism to a space T, and every finite is P1. Well, in that case, there's a unique morphism of T in the modulized space. 
there's only one morphism from this, any scheme to a point, and it has the property that for each t, the image corresponds to p1, which is the fiber. But it's not the, that's the corresponding moduli space. <coughs> it's not a fine more moduli space. For it to be a fine moduli space, it, x would have to be isomorphic to p1 cross t. So if x is isomorphic to p1 cross t, then it's the trivial deformation and it would be fine. But, but there are schemes like this that are, don't have that property. One example is a rural surface. If you take a curve C and you consider a rural surface, its fibers are all P1, but it's not globally trivial. Another slightly more sophisticated example is if you take T equal to the open subset of P5 corresponding to smooth conics, And over that, you take the universal family of conics in P5, P2, T. We've learned a lot about conics though, this, this, this time. So if you take the smooth conics in P5, that's an open set, and there's a, there's a family up here. So each fiber is a conic, but a smooth conic is isomorphic to P1. It is a curve of genus zero. So this family here, over this open set of P5, is a family of curves, all of whose fibers are P1. And therefore, of course, there's a map like this. But in this case, it's not even locally trivial for this risky topology. There does not exist any open, open, open subsets, V inside of here, over which it's actually the direct product. That's a little exercise. So it's not a firm modular. But just to throw in another little thing, on the other hand, you can find the atoll cover, atoll covers of this space which then make it trivial. So it's, it's, it's locally trivial in the atoll topology, but not in this risky topology. All right. So for the remainder of my time, then, I want to talk about something, another kind of moduli space. It's not neither coarse moduli nor coarse fine moduli, but something that in most applications would be sufficient for what you'd like to know. And it's called the modular family. So, Just a minute. And look over here. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about modular families. These were introduced by Mumford in an article uh, at the Purdue conference in 1963. The book is called Arithmetical Algebraic Geometry, and his paper was called Picard Groups of Moduli Problems. And in this, in this uh, he, he, what he wanted to set out was he wanted to study uh, the Picard group of the moduli problem of, of elliptic curves. Not the Picard group of the J-line, which is trivial, but something more interesting. But I'm not, I'm not going to talk about the Picard group. I just want to talk about the notion of a modular family. So this is something or other, which is sort of like a moduli space, but not quite, and which exists more often than regular moduli spaces, and has the nice property that we can use our infinitesimal study for properties of this thing, and it's almost as good as a moduli space. So here, here's what it is. Supposing we have a, supposing we have a moduli problem, and it could be, you know, it could be, well, we don't need to do subschemes, because they have a, they have an actual representable function. So it could be abstract schemes or vector bundles or something other. Like Let's do abstract schemes. In fact, uh, why, don't I, why don't I specialize it to uh, non-singular projective curves? I'll give a specific case, and the, uh, the definition is the same. So we consider the set of x non-singular projective curves. Okay. So what is a modular family? So a modular family is going to be a space uh, M <coughs> together with a family of curves. So this is going to be flat family of curves of genus G Okay, now what properties do I want? With the properties, first of all uh, every curve of genus G <coughs> must appear 
in the family uh, x over n at least once and at most a finite number of times. Okay, so we've 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 let go of something. We no longer ask for one-to-one -one correspondence. We're simply finite to one correspondence. So every curve has to appear, but it may occur several times, but only a finite number of times. So that's the first condition. The second condition is for each point m and m. So m and m corresponds to a curve x x m. For each point m and m, if you look at the formal family. You see, if you take, if you have a point M and M, you can look at the local ring of M at the point M and complete it. And over that, you have the family, I should call it X, M, hat. This notation is even worse than the previous notation. See, this was a real family. But what I mean is, if you, once you fix a point little m, out of this real family, you can get families over every ordered local ring. In particular, you can get families over this thing modulo every power of its maximal ideal, and that makes one of those things we call, uh, I don't know what I called it, uh, a formal, formal family. So this is the formal family over there. So the condition is, for each point m and m, this formal family should pro-represent the local uh, infinitesimal, how do you like that? Infinitesimal deformations of x sub n. Okay? See, for curves, we know the local functor is pro-representative. So I'm requiring that formally, at every point of this thing, it does pro-represent the curves. So that already implies something right away. For curves, that tells us already that m is going to be smooth in dimension 3g minus 3. So what have we lost so far? Well, we lost that it's a one-to-one -one correspondence, it's a finite-to-one correspondence. All right, now the third property is that it's universal in the following sense. So the universal flat property reads like this. For any other family, x over t. Now in the case of a coarse moduli, we had a morphism from t to n. We don't quite have that this time. So for any other family, we're going to have a morphism up to atoll coverings. So what does that mean? That means if, if for any x over t, any other family, there exists a scheme s Together, together with an atoll surjective map from S to T and a morphism from S to N. So it's not exactly a map from T to S, but after an atoll covering, you see, atoll surjective map S to N, there's a morphism there. And what, what about the pullback? Well, of course, X is not the pullback of the script X, but what happens is that uh, X cross over T S that's the pullback of this one, is isomorphic to the universal family over here, x cross over n x. So over this middle scheme, the two pullbacks are isomorphic. So it's almost, it's almost like a representable functor, except up to atoll coverings. <coughs> and uh, atoll coverings are essential, as you can see from this, from this example of conics. So it's almost as good as a fine moduli space. And the value of talking about these things is they exist. So let me give you a sketch of why there exists a modular family of curves of genus G. The hard part is in the pro-representability. Once you know the local functor is pro-representable, then the existence of the modular family is, is not, so, not so bad. The map from S to N is unique? Which one? The map from S to N. From the uh, let me see. Well, the S is not unique, first of all. No, but uh, the S the the exists one. Is the map from S to N unique? Let me think. Uh, so what does that mean? S is not unique, but if I take the, if I, if I, if I, the same S twice, do I get the same morphism? Uh, well, no, it's not unique. I'll tell you why. Supposing X was a single curve over a field. Then it would say there exists uh, S, I can take S equal to T, and there are many maps of S into there because it represents, it occurs finitely many times. So it, no, it won't be unique. Okay, so I want to sketch why does the modular family of curves exist? <clears throat> and by the way, 
uh, we also know that there exists a course moduli of curves. Uh, and that's proved in, in, in David Mumford's book, uh, Geometric Invariant Theory, which is a difficult book and a long read, and I don't really understand the proof. So I want you to appreciate that this is much simpler than proving the existence of a course module, I suppose. So, claim, <laughs> if you take pairs of genus G, there exists a modular family. Okay, so here are the steps. So first of all, take any curve of genus G, and then you take the, uh, the tricanonical embedding That is to say, you take the sequence differentials OX, tends it with itself three times. That's a very ample bundle, and it gives you an embedding of X into a projective space, PN, where N is the dimension of the global sections of this thing. Uh, what is it? It's going to be something like 5G minus 5 or something. This would be, this would be 6G minus 6, and then uh, 9 plus 1 minus G is 5G minus 5. Maybe it's 5G minus 6. Something like that. Now, the, the, the virtue of the trichonautical embedding is that any curve, this is always ample, very ample. So we get embedding. So all curves are embedded in here. So then these images, I'll call them X, uh, X canonical, are contained in a certain Hilbert scheme. The Hilbert scheme of the, whatever degree curves it is of this genus. And they form a uh, closed subset. So the collection of these canonical curves, it's not the whole Hilbert scheme, but it's a closed subset. And furthermore, any time you take, by the way, the canonical, the canonical embedding, you have to choose a basis. When you want to embed a curve, in, you have to choose a basis of this vector space. If you chose a different basis, they differ by automorphisms of PA. So the automorphisms of PN act on this space, let's call it G. And two elements in here are isomorphic as abstract curves, if and only if they're connected by this automorphism. Because if you have isomorphism of abstract curves, it takes the canonical class to the canonical class. So the curves we're looking for are essentially the fibers of this, of this, of this group action on that set. Now, dividing a, 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 an algebraic variety by group is a very difficult process. That's the whole difficulty in the <coughs> variant theory. But we simplify it here. So let me draw a picture. Uh, let's draw the orbits of G like this. Imagine these are the orbits of G. So uh, all the different points on here correspond to isomorphic curves. So in the neighborhood of one curve, this is a Hilbert scheme. A Hilbert scheme is a projective scheme. It's in some projective space. I'll just cut it with something of transversal direction, dimension until I get a slice that goes like this. I can make a slice that just hits this at one point. Of course, it may curve back around some more and hit the same fiber some other points. And then it may be, it may be ramified somewhere like that. But uh, in terms of the total space, if I throw away the ramification points uh, and I throw away uh, any fibers where it meets uh, improperly, then I'll get an open set here anyway, an open set. And over this open set, I take the restriction of the universal family on the Hilbert scheme to this thing. So that's then a, a piece of my modular family. And for every, if I, if I haven't got everything, I get a neighborhood, I'll take some other point, I get another neighborhood. So doing this a finite number of times, I get a disjoint union of families in which various curves occur finitely many times, and I get all of them at the end. So you see the non-uniqueness of M curve shows up very, very clearly, because the one I'm constructing is a disjoint union of sort of little patches, which together successfully include all possible curves. Finally, many. That's, uh, that's um, uh, quasi-compactness. You know, once, once you have an open set of something, and these are quasi-compactness, it only takes a finite number to cover them up. Now, why is this a uh, modular family? Well, first of all, I've got every curve a finite number of times. I've got a flat family over it. Um, ah, yes. Now, you see, the Hilbert scheme is a representable function. So the, the local ring of the Hilbert scheme uh, represents uh, the, the sub-schemes, and then up to isomorphism, this is, you can make the tangent, the tangent vectors transverse here, so you can show that the tangent vectors this way are just the ones you need, and then the completion of this thing, uh, you can verify that quite easily, because if you make sure these are transverse. Anytime they're not transverse, you just throw away those points and cover them with another patch. So that way you can verify that the local points are pro-represent the filter, but that's not a big problem. 
So here you have this modular family, and this is pretty much any, almost any problem you want to do about, about Hilbert scheme. Of course, this is, this, is, this is not smooth, too. Even though the coarse moduli space may have singularities, this guy is smooth. Okay, well, it's almost time to stop, so let me just say two more things. One is that if it was possible to divide this space by the equivalence relation, where two points have isomorphic fibers, then the quotient would be mg would be a coarse moduli space. Now, this may not be possible in the algebraic category, at least it's not obvious, but it is possible in the complex analytic category. You can divide by, by atol. It's, it's an atol equivalence relation. So you can, you can create the force moduli space as an algebraic space or as a compact, uh, as, a, as a, what do you call it, complex analytic space. Uh, what's hard about geometric invariant theory is to show that this coarse moduli space is actually quasi projective art. That does not come out of this method at all. And that's, that's where the strength of, of Mumper's technique is necessary. But if you don't mind not knowing whether it's projective, this is pretty nice. And uh, like I said, you stop there. Well, I want to say one more thing. Uh, I was talking, talking with David Mumford recently about this book and the modular families. He said, oh, I thought the modular family was the stack. So this is almost a stack. Even though I haven't defined a stack, but this is almost a stack.